Well, good morning and thank you for joining us for what I'm sure is going to be uh, an excellent, excellent uh, conversation on just how big the ETF industry can get. Uh, my name is Rachel Evans and I'm an ETF reporter for Bloomberg News in New York. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, two people who I'm sure are going to make for an excellent conversation. Uh, on my, my, I guess they're both on my right, but Dan Draper is on your right. Uh, he is the global head of ETFs at Invesco. His firm's been at the heart of much of the recent M&A activity within the industry, acquiring Source in Europe and Guggenheim's ETF business here, so we'll get into talking a bit about that. Um, Dan previously held leadership roles at uh, iShares, Lixor, Credit Suisse, among others, and has been at Invesco for five years. Uh, to his right uh, is uh, Bjorn, uh, Bjorn Sibern. He is NASDAQ's Executive Vice President for Global Information Services. Uh, he has responsibility for the firm's index and data products business and oversaw the launch of NASDAQ's Futures Exchange. He also previously helmed the firm's global commodities business. Now, before we get our panelists' thoughts on, on where the industry is heading, I actually wanted to turn it over to, to you guys, make my life a little bit easier, uh, and ask about where you guys think the industry is heading in terms of size. So at the moment, we're at about five trillion in assets under management globally. Uh, what I want to get a sense from, from you guys is where that will be in 2025, whether you think it will be the same, maybe five to 10 trillion, 10 to 20 trillion, or more than 20 trillion. So I'm going to ask you guys for a show of hands on the those range, and then I'm going to ask these guys what they think, whether you're right. Um, so, who thinks it will be roughly the same, about five trillion globally? Okay, good. Uh, five to ten trillion? Okay. Ten to twenty trillion? Okay. And over twenty trillion? All right. Okay. I would say rough. People seem to be in the five, to, uh, in the ten to twenty trillion kind of range. Do you guys agree? Dan, maybe, maybe you take that first. Yeah, yeah I think uh, kind of the 10 trillion, the doubling, it feels about right. I, I would be more kind of bullish, but uh, obviously AUM includes the price component. And just you know, looking at the long tooth, uh, if you will, the bull market we're in now, do we get a market correction uh, you know, through that or even, you know, God forbid, a recession? But what I would say, though, is if we do get a correction, the good news is if you look at dot-com bubble uh, or you look at even credit crisis, a lot of investors sell out of active. They come back into the market in things like ETF. So I think it's a net positive, but uh, kind of 10, 12 billion feels about right to me. Bjorn? Yeah, so I'm leaning towards 10. Um, we have been in nine years bull market. So of course, Dan, Dan mentioned the fact, fact of uh, correction in the market. Said that I, I'm relatively bullish and we could go to even 15. Uh, depends on the development in Asia. I see fantastic growth opportunity in Asia. Today it's 10, 15% of the total AUM. So great opportunities there and still great momentum and potential in Europe as well. Excellent. So I think we've done our panel now. We can go home. We've done our job. But no, I want to find out a little bit more about exactly where that growth is going to come from. And the first sort of point I want to come to there is on the product side. There's been obviously a huge amount of proliferation in, in the ETF space. I think we're at more than 1,900 products in the US alone, 3.7 trillion in assets here. It seems as though there's less and less white space for new issuers to come into and for existing issuers to fill. Um, Dan, where do you guys kind of see the white space at the moment? I think just the continued secular growth trend in fixed income ETFs. I think that's an area, obviously, fixed income indexing is just much younger than I would say equity. And I think just the nature of the OTC market of you know the underlying you know bonds and securities in that space. It just really there, there's a lot of opportunity I think to, to grow. And on a client segment basis, areas like insurance companies, for mm -hmm. example, uh, you know having uh, fixed income ETFs, NAIC kind of endorsed or appropriate from a capital perspective. So I think that that, that is uh, going to continue to be, uh, I think, a big area. Um, I think as well, you know, we've frankly seen alternative areas like commodities get relatively out of favor because of market conditions. Uh, but I still think there's a lot of opportunity to innovate in areas like that, uh, you know, alternatives like commodities as well. Bjorn, I mean, we've talked a bit in the past about kind of ESG, and there's obviously been a ton of buzz around that. Um, it seems like seldom a week goes by where someone's not launching a new ESG ETF. But so far, the assets in that have been relatively lackluster. Like, what's your sense of kind of the room for, for ESG growth here, and, and why do you think we've seen adoption a little bit underwhelming? So from a NASDAQ point of view, we are, of course, strong here in the US, but we also run the Nordic exchanges in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and especially out of Europe, we have seen a strong demand for ESG products. So our leading index in Sweden, uh, the OMX S30 index, 
we had pretty strong demand from the local investor base actually to launch a new S leading index, but ESG compliant. So actually, they were not allowed to trade the leading index because it did not have the right criteria for, from an ESG point of view. So we actually had, we have launched a new index together with the customers that is ESG compliant. This just shows the demand. When we talk to customers in Europe, more than half of all the meetings have ESG as a part of the discussion. So we see a lot of pressure demand from Europe and we start to see that more and more in um, in, uh, in US as well. And we acquired a company called Investment uh, last year. Um, and Investment sits on a lot of data from buy side companies. And they sit also on data that is uh, ESG data. Um, and that type of data is something that we see more and more of the investor base start to look at and want to have. So, um, so actually we, fee we see a lot of demand in US, but in turn of, turn of money and revenue, it's still relatively small numbers. Why do you think the US has been slower to kind of catch on than, than Europe and with regards to ESG? It's difficult to say, but I think the ESG theme has always been high on the radar in, in Europe, especially the northern part of, of Europe. So I think that's just something that, and it's not actually only institutional investors, it's also retail investors. Mm -hmm. So retail investor actually, more than half of the retail investor population actually wants to know before they invest in a company now whether it's ESG compliant or the ESG score of that company. The challenge with ESG is, of course, what is the standard? I, I don't think there's a clear standard right now. There are many different standards, so it, of course, it's a little bit weak. Uh, it's difficult to measure and handle, and there's no benchmark, real benchmark on it. So that's a little bit the challenge. Dan, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that because Invesco runs some of, uh, I guess, what would be called the kind of older version of ESG products. You have the clean tech products, you have clean energy, solar. Um, you know, the move to, in ESG has been more towards kind of these broad products. How do you kind of see ESG evolving and do you think that there's still room for some of those more specialized kind of specific products? Right. Well, we, we clearly see the thematic, you know, products that you mentioned. Uh, those have been out for a while. Obviously, they come in and out of vogue from time to time. Um, but, but I would say the larger ESG, I mean, I just echo a lot of what Bjorn said. I think if you look at Europe and you take the E, S, and G components, I just think, you know, even from a, a legislative perspective, you know, certain European countries, for gender, for example, they've uh, basically put in laws that you need to have 30% women, for example, on board. So you've seen more formal efforts not only at the government, but even societal level that's really flowing through to investment decisions. I think in the U.S., uh, we just haven't gone to that level of, of you know, imposing rules and, and national laws that are really pushing. But I would say ESG is growing in the U.S. pretty rapidly, but the definition varies. So large asset owners like pensions and others, they like the custom, customized version of how they and their boards view um, ESG. So, I mean, most of the assets we see go into separately managed accounts, which just offer more custom uh, ability. But that's where hopefully over time, retail awareness in the U.S. and also maybe more common definitions, then you can put it into a unitized product like an ETF. I wanted to pick up on something you mentioned earlier about, as well about fixed income being an area of growth. As I know that I mean, we've spoken in the past about sort of your enthusiasm for buying Guggenheim's um, bullet shares range of products. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, A, what defined maturity products like right. bullet shares are and how they can f fit into a portfolio? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. That was, uh, as you mentioned, one of the most attractive elements for us of the Guggenheim ETF acquisition. Uh, they pioneered a concept, you know, that basically taking the, the best benefits of buying individual bonds, meaning that they actually have a final maturity. So that also gives you, you know, more accurate duration experience in particular if you're building a portfolio. And particularly for many clients who want to build ladder uh, strategies, gives you the opportunity to do that in investment grade, high yield, for example. So great technology gives you more precision and, and actually it does give more tools to whether it's we see financial advisors who traditionally have had issues maybe, you know, or, or the pain of kind of rolling over individual bonds, uh, but also maybe insurance companies and others who can use the product. So we really had a lot of demand pent up. Uh, we've taken that and, and being able to build, again, different maturities that it's an open-ended fund, but it actually has an expiry date. And so then the ability for us to then bring out new ETFs with similar maturities to kind of roll it through. Whereas obviously when you have a traditional fixed income ETF that is truly open-ended, um, you know, you, you can potentially run your know, price risk, you know, through the rolling over or depending on what happens with the yield curve. Whereas here, if you're buying a bullet share product at par or below par, you know generally it's going to mature at that par value. And it gives you the refinancing opportunity beyond that. And who would you say are kind of the, the key users there? You mentioned insurers, but I'm guessing as well for financial advisors and even retail clients. Right. Too. I'd say, well, the insurance area, you know, I think we think it's an emerging area. Mm -hmm. We've seen some 
early indications, but a lot more to go. I'd say the registered investment advisor market has been very bright, uh, vibrant through Schwab or Fidel, other custodial areas where they keep their assets, but we've seen a lot of growth there. So, you know, the other client segments we focus on, wirehouses, independent broker dealers, institutional clients, it's still really early days for that technology. I guess this is kind of the, the other side to product proliferation is really kind of the, the increased adoption of, of ETFs. Uh, Bjorn, from an institutional perspective, I mean, where do you kind of see greater room for ETFs to really provide solutions to uh, institutional clients? Yeah, I, th I think if, if I look at what we do from, from a NASDAQ point of view, we still work with around 30 different themes. So we look at, at many different themes. Uh, this is probably not so much for the institutional side, but we launched a Mariana Index earlier this year on the 4th, uh, 4th of, uh, of 20th of, of April, um, a special Mariana date. So this just shows that we are working with many different themes. Uh, some of them are more tilted towards the retail customers, and some of them are tilted towards the institutional base. Um, so, yeah. Do you have a sense of where the kind of most of the growth is going to come from, you know, in the future? I mean, given that the ETF market is often viewed as being quite retail oriented, it seems that the institutional side is still newer and therefore maybe has more room to grow. But I'm curious, like, whether pension plans or insurers or hedge funds. Are or RIAs even, yeah. which of those kind of you think is sort of an area that, where people can focus to actually really make sure that their product is reaching people that would benefit from it? Yeah, so we launched an um, AI uh, and robotics index which has interest from institutional base uh, and the interest has not only been from US, we launched it uh, together with the ETF issuer in US, but it also has interest in, in Asia. <laughs> So uh, this is one of the products that has uh, interest from the institution base. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned kind of Asia and sort of overseas growth, because obviously we tend to be very focused on, on where U.S. growth is going to come from. But one of the big opportunities seems to be uh, in Europe and, and I guess in Asia. Bjorn, maybe you can speak to this a little bit in terms of where growth is going to come from. We're now 3.7 trillion-ish in, in the U.S. right now in assets, about 5 trillion globally. How do you think you know, growth in Europe and Asia is going to evolve? Uh, is it going to become as big as the market? market here or will we still see it lagging a little? So uh, if you look at Asia, it's probably only 15% of, of the size mm. of the US market. Of course, the potential is huge, so we just see the start of the beginning. Uh, what we do from a NASDAQ point of view, we actually team up with the local ETF issuers that launched a, quite often a NASDAQ 100 product. Um, um, and that's a step for them, for the local, mainly retail customers, to trade NASDAQ 100 in local currency. And when we have launched that together with a local ETF issuer, we follow up and launch the AI robotics index and, and the ETFs around that, or NASDAQ Biotech. So that's, that's for us the growth journey. We have launched uh, products around NASDAQ 100 in seven countries in Asia, so Japan, Hong Kong, China, uh, Australia. And that's, that's the way for us to grow the business. Uh, we start with NASDAQ 100, but then we add some of the thematic themes, indices, ETFs, around that as a step two. From a European point of view, uh, post the LIBOR scandal, uh, and now we have the, the EMEA regulation has changed the landscape a bit, a bit. So to sell and pitch your products in Europe, you have to go through a benchmark uh, administrator, and we will be applying for that uh, later this year. So we hope that we will run the Nordic version of the LIBOR, the NIBOR, Stiber, and Kyber in Europe. But that's, of course, something we do together with the, with the local banks and community. So regulation is hard and takes a lot of effort and a lot of cost. But for us, it actually, actually creates a lot of opportunities. Quite many of the banks in Europe do not want to do the index calculations themselves anymore. So they outsource it to an index provider, customer, like us. Interesting. So there's opportunities in regulation as, as well as cost there. And actually, the, I'm glad you brought up regulation because, Dan, from an issuer's perspective, MIFID was the talk of last year. That's what everybody was concerned about preparing for. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, you tell me, but it feels like it's been a bit of a damp squib in terms of its immediate impact on the ETF market. What's, what's your kind of sense of, of where we're at with MIFID? I'd say, I mean, maybe a little bit of a damp. We have to put in context that uh, uh, net new asset inflows, if you will, into the European ETF market uh, are about half year to date, similar to the US where they were in 2017, which was a record year. They basically doubled from 2016. So a little bit kind of less demand, economic reasons, what have you, um, on that. But I think if you look also that MIFID II was pretty well telegraphed. So you saw a lot of exchanges, market makers, uh, MTFs, for example, who were preparing. So you actually saw, I think, a, a buildup. 
Uh, if we actually look at the numbers, um, you know, the over-the-counter trade, so basically MIFID II requires a lot more transparency, which is good for ETFs, pre- and post-trade reporting. And, and if you estimate the numbers we've seen kind of year-to-date, we think prior to MIFID II implementation, you're probably missing about 70% of the over-the-counter trading volume, you know, in Europe, which is huge. So all of that has now become more transparent. Uh, and we've actually, just in our own products at Invesco, we've seen a doubling of our OTC volumes now that we can identify them. And what I think is particularly really exciting, and this is something I give you know, Bloomberg credit, so kudos to Bloomberg, uh, you announced, I think, earlier this week uh, that by December, if you go to the DES or description function of any ETF, Bloomberg's now going to be providing a consolidated tape. So this is something we take for granted in the U.S., but this is really huge in Europe. So I think, you know, like I said, looking forward to that uh, consolidated tape and you're really getting an idea because the long-term game in Europe is to get more uh, independent financial advisor and retail adoption, which is still really small. But I think this is a, you know, I think a, a really important, uh, you know, big, big step towards doing that. So I, I think you're right in terms of the numbers, uh, just the demand has been down overall, but in terms of underneath it and now just starting to see more and more volume, more confidence for market makers to participate, uh, we're very encouraged with what MIFID II has kind of brought so far. Yeah, I think one, one important point uh, around MIFID II, so MIFID II was, uh, was a huge uh, regulation uh, and it took a lot of time and effort, not only for the exchange, but for more or less all the banks and brokers in Europe. And I put a little bit pause on new products because companies just have to spend a lot of time to just be compliant. Mm. I think we have passed that now. So now you can start to see the uptick in the ETF, AUM growth. Uh, what is also important to realize that the European market is fragmented. So you have different growth opportunities in different markets. It's not the same regulation, exactly the same regulation that the local authorities have implemented MIFID II. So, and also the tradition is different. So the ETF growth is different from country to country. The potential is different from country to country because of tradition, because of different implementation, because of different distribution channels in each of the countries. So I think that you just have to realize that Europe is actually more than just one market. It has so many different dimensions. We see something similar in Asia, but I think Europe is very special because you have many years of this building many different distribution channels and, and the bank sits on, on heavily on that in Europe, quite many countries, and they have a tendency not necessarily to launch ETF, but to stick to the mutual funds and the more expensive products. But I think you will see the uptick within the next couple of years. Europe is also way behind US. Everything Bjorn mentioned is true, but in spite of some of these kind of plumbing, if you will, uh, uh, headwinds, if you look at the growth trend of ETF growth in the US and you kind of overlay Europe, it's almost identical, you know, rate of growth. Just Europe is about seven years behind. So it's going the same direction, you know, much more of an institutional market than retail. So all these differences, but the demand seems to be growing on a very similar path that we've had here. So, I mean, how have you kind of been seeing that play out now that you guys have bought source in Europe, as I mentioned in my mm. introduction? Uh, you know, Bjorn obviously mentioned the fragmentation that's a kind of challenge in Europe, despite MIFID creating a consolidated tape. So how have you kind of seen that play out and, and sort of what's been your experience so far? Yeah, well, I think that Bjorn mentioned earlier that, I mean, Europe is really dominated or has been uh, by the banks because uh, they have just pretty much historically, especially continental Europe, own distribution, right? Uh, they have the same banking clients. They could sell the same funds to them. So we've obviously seen since the credit crisis an ability for, you know, traditional asset managers like us to pick up market share, which we have. Uh, but what I would mention is because of that institutional uh, dominance, if you will, of demand for ETFs in Europe, you have to show up with size and scale. These, Unlike, I think, the very vibrant RIA market, who's really helped the, you know, the fee-based market, the U.S. grow, and then that intermediate retail, you don't have that in Europe. So this is where we felt after six or seven years of kind of organic growth, we weren't getting the scale we needed. We needed to make an acquisition, and at the time, Source was the largest independent player. So getting the talent, the scale to you know, really be relevant and clearly being able to do that uh, as we go into the MIFID II environment, that was really our thinking. And, and again, it's been, I think, reinforced. I was say, have you kind of noticed the difference then when you now go in to talk to big pension plans mm -hmm. and say, hey, you know, we're actually a lot bigger than when we last met. Can we talk? Is Absolutely. That, is that been a big change? Because yeah. the, this is where if, when you're running a business like ETFs, you're always thinking about your product development and your kind of distribution. And, and what I think the problem is that so many subscale players, if you invest in your distribution, you get a big team out there talking. But then even if you have 50 ETFs that are maybe 5 to 10 million in size, 
nice to meet you, thank you, but come back when it's one to 200 million. Mm -hmm. So you can spend a lot of money building, or the vice versa, you can have a lot of products and not have enough distribution. So I think getting that, that synergy right, uh, it's very challenging. I think for us to really look at you know, Invesco's large distribution team, we really had more of the demand for product and scale, and that's really where the acquisition you know, made, made a very big difference. Bjorn, do you expect to see more acquisitions amongst issuers? I mean, obviously, they're clients for you guys, as well as sort of competitors sometimes. But do you think there'll be more consolidation as people like Dan try to move into Europe and take their business to, to the next level? So first of all, when I, when I saw the source acquisition, I felt it was a great, great move. Uh, I think that's the way to grow in, mm -hmm. in Europe, because it will take such a long time to grow organically. Um, I think it's difficult to find, actually, acquisition targets in Europe. It's, it's, there are not that many, so I think that that will be a be a challenge. So uh, consolidation, I think we'll see some of that, but I, there are not that many opportunities uh, out there. Um, but I actually feel that the right way, and that is also what uh, BlackRock have been doing in Europe, actually done acquisitions yeah. to grow in Europe because the market are different. Uh, different. Uh, if you launch an ETF in in London in in pounds, uh, then you have to challenge that a retail investor in Stockholm want to trade it in Swedish Krona, so you need to consider should I launch it in, in Stockholm as well and launch it in Swedish Krona. So it's a different market and it takes much longer time to build both the distribution but also basically to distribute it out to the retail customers. And I guess the, the other reason kind of behind you know, consolidation is really this, this desire for efficiency within businesses. We're seeing compression on fees, which is obviously great for investors, but hard for issuers and indexers to, to kind of manage. Dan, I, I want to come to you first on that. How do you kind of offset this sort of march towards zero when it comes to, to fees? Is it new products? Is it accepting this and finding new ways to get revenue? Like, How do you kind of manage this whole process? Yeah, well, I think if you look at kind of the overall environment, I mean, you know, maybe you know, 10 years ago, you had a true early growth phase of ETF development. I mean, companies, a lot of, you use the term white space to try new products, to go after new client segments. People are just trying to pull their model together. I think clearly now we're moving into a more mature part of the growth phase. And like consumer products or other industries, you have you know, different ways of competing. So I think that on that broad spectrum between being a differentiator, particularly on your investment content, versus being a low-cost leader, you know, that, I think those more mature elements are really starting to come to the forefront, you know, in the industry. And I think how you think about, like, for example, I think at Invesco, we've always been a major differentiator, uh, kind of, you know, doing smart beta, multi-factor products as early as 2003. I think that's kind of in our culture. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we also have to be aware now we have $220 billion under management, um, actively, you know, manage kind of our pricing functions. So we've, we've spent a lot of time and effort building, like I said, if you think more of like a consumer branded you know, company, we've tried to build a pretty dy dynamic pricing model, making sure that we are competitive. You know, so I think we're giving it a lot more thought. Uh, I do think that you know, different providers uh, have different revenue streams or different ultimate goals. So not everyone is going to have the same type of view, but I do think that you, you need to be able to lead with a, a strong pricing strategy. But ultimately, you know, most investors are going to want to see what's in my pocket. So what is my net return after fees? And I think that's really where the smart beta, the more differentiated enhanced index ETFs, it's going to take longer. But I think getting enhanced risk premium, enhanced return, there's still real value or even active ETFs you know, to be there. So again, it's, I think pricing has become a, a little bit more uh, at a retail level and more in the headlines. Uh, but I think it's, it's something to be expected if you're in a more mature industry. Bjorn, how does that then knock on to affect the, yeah. the indexes? So uh, investors are sensitive to fees, and they should be. Um, said that what we focus at is actually product where we add value. So we do not really run after the low fee uh, customers. So we actually try to, to build out new products that have high value and customers are willing to pay for high quality and high value products. So three years ago, a little bit more than three years ago, we acquired a company called Dorsey Wright uh, that is more technical anal analysis. It's product that are more expensive, but also create more value. And I think that's a little bit what we're trying to do, the same with what we do on the thematic products that we are launching, so AI robotics or the ESG products. We can charge more for those products because it's at value. So we have, when I look at my, our product portfolio uh, and I look at the basis points that we're getting, it has been more or less been flat for, um, for the last two years. So yes, uh, fees are on the agenda. We compete against the other index calculators. Uh, Self-indexing is also there. But actually, we'll f I feel that we have found a great spot in the market, and that's, that's what we're running after.
If I could add, I just think yeah. to have to be a, a leading provider, I think you need to have three type of delivery mechanisms for the ETF. The traditional third party index, uh, you know, relationships, which obviously I think in equities are still going to be really strong. Uh, you know, Invesco launched the first active, so having that capability. And then Bjorn mentioned self-indexing. So, I mean, one, uh, one type of, of delivery doesn't necessarily meet all demands, but I think you need to have all of the capabilities uh, in your business plan of being able to price accordingly, you know, based on the, the uh, experience you're trying to give the client. I'm glad you guys both brought up self-indexing as that's been a, a kind of a big trend that we're starting to see more of from issuers. And Invesco obviously mm. came out earlier this year with a couple of self-indexed products. Why did you kind of take that, that sort of decision to, to go into indexing yourselves? How, and how big, a, I guess, part was cost versus kind of that, a need to differentiate? No, I think, I mean, our biggest consideration is always clients and what kind of the clients need. And I think, um, you know, the uh, self-indexing we used, obviously, we, we, that was one of the big benefits we got through Guggenheim. And we still partner with NASDAQ because they're the calculating agent for that, for example. So even though you still have a lot of the same players together, but as in self-indexing grows, then data, uh, calcul there are different services, even third-party indexers still need to provide for that. Uh, but I think for us, the demand was more internal. Invesco has a very large um, commitment building out a solutions business, ultimately feeding to our, our robo-platform, which is called GemStep. So we were looking really at new client segments. And, and developing models in kind of that robo space. So this was really for us being able to customize a solution with in-house intellectual property and then being able to kind of get it through. So clearly we hope there's more than just that channel, but I would say that was really the strongest feedback we had, you know, leading that and, and obviously using it for self-indexing like bullet shares or we have some new uh, a factor uh, fixed income products. That was the best way for us to go. Bjorn, do you see that as kind of a serious threat to the, the indexing business, or, or does it kind of just make you think about changing, I guess, your, your revenue streams up a little bit to provide that data, to provide that calculation services? It's not, it's not a big threat to our business. Uh, of course, it's there, and it will probably increase also going forward, said that there's already competition. So what we try to focus on, and that's what we actually do quite a lot, so we spend a lot of time on the global glo growth. That's a great opportunity for us, just globalizing NASDAQ 100 a fantastic brand, a fantastic product. We have just started that, that journey, so that's a great opportunity for us. Said that, we also try to work with some of the players in the market that has been active, that want to move into passive space. Mm -hmm. So they team up with us, they come with index ideas, we spend time with them, we launch an index, they launch an ETF on, based on that, smart beta or multi-factor. So actually working closely with many new ETF issues, that's a big part of our business as well. And that's around 30, 35 different kind of themes that we're working with. So that's more what we focus on, a, a partnership with new ETF issuers or many of the existing ETF issues. Is there a sense at all um, that actually investors also lose out a little bit from focusing too much on the, the expense ratio? Obviously, it's a very kind of seductive uh, sort of premise, isn't it? If something costs practically nothing, why not buy it? But I mean, does that kind of get in the way, do you think, of, of investors thinking more about kind of the fundamentals of what they're buying, Dan? Uh, look, absolutely. As I said, I mean, for me, it's you know, what money do you put in your pocket ultimately, right? So focusing on net returns, and it's probably more, you know, I spent 14 years in Europe, as you did, and even 10, 12 years years ago, Deutsche Bank actually lost, uh, launched temporarily a, a zero uh, expense ratio Eurostox 50, which is the big benchmark. Um, but you know, it didn't become overly prevalent. I think it was the ability for uh, liquidity, tracking error, but ultimately, what was the performance? And if it's at a portfolio level, also the important correlation benefit, is this product helping me diversify? But I do think we are going with uh, many new entrants. You have direct consumer firms like the Schwabs and Fidelities of the world, you know, who, who are going to get into the space. But I think overall investors will settle to a place where is this delivering a strategy, obviously at the right expense ratio, but more importantly, am I getting a net return and, if you will, a, a, a portfolio construction benefit where this really, you know, I think adds value. And particularly, I think that's why factor investing or even larger smart beta, you know, it's growing very quickly, but I think that's where the bigger opportunities you know, going to be down the road about you know, which of these strategies really do work well and it becomes a bit more kind of self-selection. And I think expense ratio will be maybe consideration two, three, four, five, but not necessarily the top consideration. I think risk-adjusted performance will definitely lead. Good stuff. So it's not all about the fees, guys. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to chat with me and our, our wonderful audience uh, this morning. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan and Bjorn, very much.